Good morning. We had talked about uh, schedules and this kind of stuff, you know, when uh, you, if you've ever lost a loved one, and most of us have, it's very difficult to try to do kind of timing and all that because actually the timing is in the Lord's hand. And so we, we talked about this, and Ed and I sat down, and he called me, and, and so uh, you will get what you get this morning. Yes, absolutely. We are continuing in our series, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, so I ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Titus chapter 2, uh, verses 11 through 15. That's where we're going to, again, hang. That's kind of been the theme uh, verses that we've used to kind of propel us into this, uh, this thing called Fifty Shades of Grace. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, grace and glory. And oftentimes when, when we think of grace, we, we kind of go one-sided with this. Sometimes we think grace is, is all about us. And, and in some sense it is, but it's really not totally all about us. Because again, the whole idea of, of, of God intervening in the affairs of man, actually, in a sense, he really never really intervened in the sense that we think there was intervention. God saw all of this going on. You know, what took place in the garden did not surprise the Father, right? Because we know that Scripture says that what Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. So again, in, in this idea that all of this uh, caught you know, God uh, offhand, it, it didn't. It didn't. And so we need to look at the idea of grace. It's not just for our benefit as well. In fact, God does a lot of things for his own benefit. And, and God can pull that off because God is absolutely perfect. God is not arrogant in the way that we would think arrogance rolls for us as humans. Because if we do everything that's all about us, then it's a different ballgame because we're, we're imperfect people. However, God can do that. God says, I can do everything the way I want it. And it serves everyone. It serves us. Because God can pull it off because He's perfect in that. So I want us to look at this today from the standpoint of grace and the glory of God. There's a definition that I found yesterday, so it's not in your outline. John Piper wrote this definition about what it means to define the glory of God. It is going public of His holiness. That's an amazing thing. It is God going public concerning His holiness. You have to understand that this world, when they see us as believers, they really are truly seeing a reflection of who God is. They're really seeing a reflection of who Jesus says He was and has claimed and why He came here. It is the way He puts His holiness on display for people to apprehend. It's an amazing thing when, when people begin to catch this idea that God truly, really exists. And not only does He exist, but He also really cares about His creation. He cares about us. And so the glory of God is the holiness of God that is made manifest, that is made evident, that is made public. What that simply means is this. If you get right down to it, we truly are to become the reflection and the glory of God. We truly are to become that. That is, that is the whole idea of grace. We go on in your outline. The goal of grace truly is the glory of God. The goal of grace is the glory of God. The verse here in Ephesians 1 6 it says, ultimately, hey, Barn, I got some kind of feedback up here on the stage. Just take me out of here, probably. The goal of grace is the glory of God. Ultimately, God is the one worthy of praise for showing us His grace. He is merciful and marvelous, freely given us these gifts in His beloved or in Christ. We need to let that ruminate here. Ultimately, God is the one worthy of praise for showing us His grace. We got nothing to boast about. Zero, because first of all, we understand the whole idea of grace is that grace is given to those who really didn't deserve it, right? I mean, that's the truth. So the ultimate aspect of God's great is not how great we become, but how great He is in us. And so that's why ultimately God is the only one worthy of praise for showing us His grace 
Because He is merciful. He is marvelous. And I'm glad He is merciful. I mean, His mercy is, is almost an unconditional mercy where oftentimes our mercy is conditional. As, as Brian shared last week when we got to that word retribution, you know, we're, we're great about us receiving mercy, but for us to dispense it, it's a whole different ball game. And that's when, if you really want to get down to it, when we are at a place in our life that we can actually get away from us wanting to have retribution and say, God, I'm going to show mercy. Even when that mercy is not even deserved, that is when God gets the glory. When we do things like that, when our nature is so changed that we become like Christ, then you begin to see the true glory of God manifest. And that's why grace, the ultimate goal of grace, is the glory of God. The only way people's lives are going to be changed is if they see God working in other people. They're going to take notice. They're going to see, I, I know this person, or, or I, I can't believe they did this. Because oftentimes, when, when something is so horrendous, and yet the, the act or something that was done to someone, that person is able to forgive. Can't do that in regular human nature. It's not in our nature. Human nature is to get back. How, you know, you made me miserable, so I'm now I'm going to make you miserable. It is that. And if we can move past the retribution stage, that's a huge deal. Because then, again, the grace of God begins to manifest His glory. A couple of Old Testament references here in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 11. God says it like this, for my own glory, for my own glory. Listen to what he says. I do it. God says, I refrain and do not utterly destroy you. God was in all of his mercy and all of his grandeur. And when he picked the Hebrews out, I mean, they gave God a hard time. I mean, it, the whole entire book of the Old Testament is about the people of God turning their backs on him. And, and going off to other places to, to try to worship other gods. And, and God is always constantly wooing them back. In fact, the whole book of Jeremiah that we're going to get into is, is going to be how you know, the children of God turned their back on Him and He allowed different captivities for the people of Israel to somehow bring them back to Him. The beautiful thing of that is this. Um, if we're around long enough, we'll see them Recognize him as Messiah in the last days. Because there's time when, when that's, that realize that, that veil will be lifted from their eyes. So God says it like this For my glory, not for your sake. Can you imagine? You know, it's not for your sake. It's for my glory and my glory that I refrain and do not utterly destroy you. For why should I permit my name to be polluted and profane? God is saying, Why am I going to allow? My name, because of how you're acting to profane it. Yes. It's almost God says, I would love to take you out. But there's one thing God cannot do. He cannot go against his covenant. He will not go against his covenant. He will not go against what he has promised to his people. He said, which would be the Lord completely destroying his chosen people. He says, I will not give my glory to another. When he said it like that, he said, I will not allow my people to worship any other God. And I will not allow this unbelieving world to see my people utterly destroyed because I have made a promise and I've made a covenant. That's giving grace for his glory. That's giving grace for his glory. The next Old Testament is Isaiah 57, 18 and 19. And God says it like, yes, I, God, have seen what they do. But he says, I'm going to heal them anyway. God says, I see what's going on. I see the rebellion. I see the depravity. I see all that, but I am going to heal them anyway. Not only will I begin to heal them, but I am going to lead them, and I am going to comfort them. God says, I am going to show you the way of my grace. I'm going to bring you to that place of grace. I'm going to help you mourn and I'm going to help you confess your sin because your sin is an affront to my glory. And God says, I'm going to give you the way to lay it all down and to be born again. 
and have a relationship with me. And then he says, peace, peace to them, both near and far, which means Jews and Gentiles. That's, that was a prophetic statement that he used in Isaiah. Because I'm bringing my people and, my, and the Gentiles, for I will heal them all. I think sometimes for us, uh, we, we, I've been having this um, conversation about what the definition uh, of a Gentile is. And we oftentimes think that that definition is, you know, Westerners. A Gentile is a non-Jew. That's a whole lot of other people. That's a whole lot of other people. That's what a Gentile is. And, and I think sometimes we forget that we Gentiles were engrafted in to the vine. Because you do realize that the first people who made up the first church were not Westerners. The first church was not like First Baptist, First Wesleyan, or First whatever here in America. The first church were filled with who? Jewish believers, right? Absolutely. So again, sometimes our mindset, we, we, we tend to forget that. And so again, we have to understand that, you know, Tim, you're a Gentile. I'm a non-Jew. I was not born in any kind of kingly lineage that I know of. And so the beautiful thing about what God did with, with me and you is that he actually engrafted us into the vine. So basically, you know, Jews don't need to become like me. I need to become like them in a sense because they are the true vine. And God began to look at the people that he chose. And for whatever reason, he chose Israel. He chose the Hebrews for whatever reason. And God says, yes, you have, you have caused me great pain. You have caused me great anguish. But yet, I love you. And for my glory, since I chose you, for my glory, God is saying, I'm going to bring you to myself. That is the power of God's grace. That is the absolute power of His grace. So I want us to look at some things today from our theme verse that gives glory to God. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. <coughs> it says it like this. It says, For the saving gift of God, which is the grace, the saving gift of God, which is also Jesus, the saving gift of God has appeared to all men. And this grace, this appearing, instructs us to renounce wickedness and worldly lusts and to live sensibly and righteously and reverently in the present age. Like right now, this, this present age in which you and I find ourselves in, God's grace instructs us, God's grace empowers us, God's grace trains us. God's grace does all of this in their life. So again, we don't want to use the culture as an excuse not to give God glory in this present age and in our life. And the reason grace does this is verse 13, because it is looking for the blessed expectation and the esteemed appearance of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Messiah. In other words, that my grace is not about how you can live now and have have a sense of completeness here in this age. But His grace also prepares us for even a longer lifespan. Brian touched on it last week. I love it. I hadn't heard it said like that in a long time. And I had to be reminded when Brian says, not only do I have eternal life, I'm living it now. And we even mentioned it Wednesday night. It's amazing that before we knew Jesus, we can never be at two places at one time. Now as believers, I can be at two places at one time. Scripture says I'm already there with him. Seated with him. Don't ask me to explain it. I can't. But God says it. So for the first time, we can be at two places at one time. But because of Christ. Because there is... This actually, this present age that you and I are in are preparing us for the next great age. And that's the one Jesus will usher in when he comes back. So when we look at this entire aspect of, of God's grace and how grace truly is the, the ultimate aspect of bringing God glory, that you and I actually as believers in Jesus, 
can glorify him in our life right now. We don't have to wait then. We don't have to wait till Jesus comes back. God is saying, I'm going to put my holiness on display now. And if we get right down to it, when you and I go and look in the mirror, we need to say, I am a display of the holiness of God. Because I don't have any holiness within myself. Scripture says there are none righteous. What? No, not one. The best that you got is still not the best. So God is saying everything about His grace, everything about you and me as a believer really is to bring glory to Him. That's a, that's a huge deal. We can't pull that off without Christ in us. And again, Christ is our hope and glory. He goes on and says, He gave Himself for us. Jesus gave Himself for us. He redeemed us from all lawlessness and sin and to cleanse for Himself a people. I don't know how you think about this, but the more I look at this, it keeps resonating with me, being a part of God's chosen people, part of what God says, I can't break my covenant. God says, don't you understand? I raised you up to bring me glory in this present age. I, I raised you up. I, I saved you. You were born again for the very aspect to be evidence of the holiness of God. That's huge. That's big. He gave himself. And now we're his possession. And we need to be ardent for good works. In other words, now that I'm born again, I have the capability of doing what God wants me to do. Because what I do now for him, it's not a way to heaven. He's already given me that through his son. And in 15, he says, Speak these matters and urge and reprove with all authority. And let no one despise you. In other words, the things that we're going to talk about are the things that we need to continue to, to live, to walk, and to remind each other and to those in whom we are showing the glory of God do. So let's uh, jump into this. First of all, number one, number one, God saves us for His glory. God saves us for His glory. Verse 11, for the saving gift of God has appeared to all men. Look at what Paul was saying to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. Paul said it like this, and the master shall rescue me. We need rescuing. We need to be delivered. You and I need to be rescued from, from, from the, the really the quote, the little God of this age. We need to be rescued from our human nature that separates us from God. It's our sin nature that keeps us from really loving Him. It's our sin nature that keeps us from really knowing the truth. It's our sin nature that will not allow His truth to really reside in our life. However, when we are born again and when we are saved, when God erases the sin in our life through His Son, Jesus Christ, when we are born again, it's a game changer. Everything, truly everything becomes new. We have this new realization that God really is who He says He is. That the Bible really means what it says and that a culture is going against what God says and, and that somehow, somehow I need to be the evidence of someone who's born again. In other words, when you're born again, you don't hide under the rock. You let people know by your life, by your talk, and by your speech. Paul says, the master shall rescue me from every wicked work and save me for his heavenly reign. It's an amazing thing. That we get to reign with Christ when he comes back. It's going to be an incredible time. Paul understood this. Paul says, it's not just about now, it's also about then. And it says, to, be him, to Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. When is the last time we really gave God the glory for what He has done in our life through the grace of His Son? 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 22. It says, For God would not cast away His people. For His great namesake, seeing it pleased Him to make you his people. I want you to understand that. It's an amazing thing. God takes great pleasure in us. 
Think about that. Because when he takes great pleasure in us as his people, he's really taking great pleasure in his son. Because every born again believer has Christ living within them. And God has been pleased with his son on multiple occasions that we have read in the New Testament. God says, I will not cast away my people. Let's be honest. For some of us as believers, think about this. Some of us as believers, we, we've made some of, most of our longest time with him in a prodigal period of life. How many of you ever really walked away? You walked away, but you still came. Didn't make a lot of sense, did it? How many, how many of us really, if we were honest in our walking away, that nobody really noticed when we did because we still came to church? Right? And, and the thing is, now, do you understand the misery of what that would be like knowing in some sense that you're just faking it? And somehow in the great grace of God for His namesake, catch this, for His namesake, He brought you back. Because the prodigal son would have never came back unless he knew how great and graceful his father was. Think about that. I love this. These are some really obscure Old Testament verses. I love it because, again, we have to understand, <coughs> however God has dealt with Israel in the Old Testament, he reflects it by dealing with us in the New Testament. It's the beautiful thing. God will not cast away His people for His great name's sake. Seeing it pleased Him to make you His people. I am so glad that our Father, when we as believers, when we as His children, almost willingly and willfully want to walk away. Captured in our own sense again that I'm in charge and thanks God for whatever else. We may go that way for a while, but the pull of the Father's grace brings us back. And when you think about that story, when the father ran to the son, I mean, I, it blows my mind to think that God would run to one who ran away from him and yet he did. And, and God says, it's as much for my glory as it is for you. In other words, every time God dispenses grace, it should bring glory to him. Because if we're going to testify and give a testimony, it ain't about us, is it? It really is about the grace of God, right? And when we testify to that, that really is bringing glory to Him because we, we were nothing before Him. And even sometimes as believers, and we're going to find out how incredible God is to bring His, 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 His wanderers back because it's for His glory. I love the idea that when God does something for His glory, I get to benefit from it. From the power of His grace. Isaiah 43, verses 6 and 7. He says it like this. Bring my sons from afar. Bring my daughters from the ends of the earth. All those who are called by my name. Listen to that. All those who are called by my name, whom I have created and formed and even made for my what? Glory. That's an amazing thing. God has saved me for His glory. Tim, I have called you out. Those who I have called, those who I have brought out, those who I have set apart, those who I have created and formed for the very sense of bringing glory to my name. He's bringing us all together for His glory that we may show forth His grace. God saves us for His glory. You're not saved just simply to to have a get out of hell free card. You are saved, number one, because you needed to be saved. And you are here today saved because God has called you out. You were born again. For His glory. Think about that. Because Scripture says it like this. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, No matter what you eat, what you drink, you are to do it all for the glory of 
God. That means for us as believers, everything, everything that we do, say, and act, needs to be brought under the fact that it needs to bring glory to the Father. That's, that's a big deal, isn't it? And that's why it takes Jesus in us to pull it off. You can't, you can't sit in Sunday school for 70 years and, and pull that off. You had to have Jesus in your heart to pull that off. You really do. Nothing that we try to formulate as any kind of ministry can pull that off unless Christ is in you. Unless Christ is in us. So God saves you for His glory. Secondly, God changes us for His glory. God changes us for His glory. In verse 12, His grace instructs us to renounce wickedness. In other words, we call wickedness out. Think about that. When we say we renounce wickedness, we're calling it out. No more. No way. I'm not going to be all in on this. I, I know what that life's like. I know what it, life was like without him. No way. I renounce it. I'm not that person anymore. That's a powerful statement. That's bringing glory to God. You can't say that in any other way. It's bringing glory to him. To renounce wickedness and worldly lust and to live sensibly and righteously and reverently in this present age. Our change and what God does in our transformation brings glory to him. Again, that's the whole idea for you to stand up and give a testimony is saying, this is what I was, but this is who I am now. And this is what God has changed in my life. I am no longer the person I used to be. I'm no longer wicked and evil and full of myself. I have found who I am and I found who I am in Jesus and Him alone. One of the greatest ways to know that you and I have been born again and the greatest ways to know is by watching our behavior change. The things that once brought us great pleasure no longer really brings that pleasure to us. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 18. Paul said it like this. Paul says, when one turns to the master, the veil is taken away. In other words, when you and I are born again, this the veil, Scripture tells us in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, that the God of this age, the little G of this age, has blinded the eyes of unbelievers. In other words, one time we once were veiled. We couldn't see past ourselves. We were so full of ourselves, we couldn't see past it. But as being born again, when one turns to the master, that veil, that darkness is taken away. And as Brian was even saying in his prayer, the only the moment that we come to know him is the moment that we begin to have clarity. The moment we come to know Jesus is the moment that we see things clearly. We no longer see things in, in, a, in a shroud or in a darkness. All of a sudden, things begin to make more sense than they ever have in our whole life. And the reason they didn't before, because when you live in darkness, you can't see. But now that you are in the light, as He is in the light, He brings clarity to our life. Paul says, now Christ is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of Christ is, there is freedom. Freedom. And, as, and, and we all, as with veiled, unveiled face, we see as in a mirror the glory of Christ and are being transformed into the same likeness from glory to glory. In other words, when this is all said and done, because what God started in you, God will finish it. What's taking place is when the end game is done, we get to reflect the glory of Christ. You realize that when Jesus comes back, and everybody who is God's will be together and you do realize that we will not hang out in heaven. You're there for a bit. So don't get caught up with the heavenly stuff. Because God says in the end, I'm going to create a what? A new heaven and a new earth. And then when He renovates this place, we come back here. It's called the New Jerusalem. Revelation chapter 20 
and 21. You want to talk about the word glory used a ton of times. Revelation woo, is all about God's glory. And we think, man, where does that come from? It, it really is. That's why it's called revelation. Reveal. Unveiling. To actually show us His greatness and His holiness. I'm looking forward to that. I, I'm glad that right now I'm living in temporary housing. Temporary housing. As a believer, because of Jesus, he's got a room ready. And I don't really care how it's furnished. It may, it may have a jacuzzi or not. I don't know. I don't know if there'll be jacuzzis in heaven. All I know is this. We will be with him. And that's going to make all the difference. In fact, you know what? It should make all the difference even now. It should make all the difference even now. It goes on. It says, and as we see, unveiled face, we see in a mirror the glory of God. And we are being transformed. And transformed into the same likeness. From glory to glory as from Christ the Spirit. That I am glad that I am truly God's work in progress and that He never stops working. And here's the beautiful thing for those of us who have been prodigals before. Isn't it amazing that even in our prodigal days, He was still working. I, here's the foolishness of a prodigal, which I think is great. You cannot outrun the Father. You might think you've left Him, you might think you have done. You might think, I'm done with you, God. I'm done with this. You may think that. You may think that. But I'll tell you what. It is the power of His grace that chases us because even the prodigal in his worst day felt the pull of the Father because it says He came to Himself. And says, what the heck am I doing here? That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen except for the Father. I am grateful for the power of His grace. It, what, a, what an incredible way for God to show His glory. He says, you're my chosen. You're my people. I'm not, I'm not breaking covenant on you. You will come back to me. That's an incredible... In fact, if you get right down to it, I don't know how much you guys look at news, but I'm telling you, what's taking place now and, and what's taking place and how God is gathering His people from every corner of the earth to be assembled in Israel, that has to happen. And it is happening. And it's all part of His plan to bring those who belong to Him to Him. This is not a happenstance thing. It's, I'm absolutely amazed when I sit there and watch the hand of God do all kinds of things in our world. And I'm glad I'm a part of it. I'm absolutely glad I'm a part of it. First Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Peter writes it like this, Beloved ones, beloved ones, since God is changing us, I appeal to you as sojourners and pilgrims. In other words, right now, you and I are just passing through here. You do realize that this is not your home no more. It's done. We go, the, the place that you go home to is, is, is a temporary place. Your real home is a home with God. That's your real home. That's, that is, the, that is the, uh, the draw of every true, un, uh, every true believer. Anyway, this is not my own. And since this is not my place anymore, this, I'm sojourning. I'm just kind of passing through. I'm a pilgrim. Which means, since I have that mentality, I can bring God's glory a lot more because I don't have to fear what other people say or do to me. Because this ain't my home. It's, it's sort of like when uh, back in the day when, when churches had revivals and they would bring somebody in that said everything that the pastor couldn't say. Because if the pastor said what he said, the pastor would probably be booted out. So I'm going to bring a guy in to say what needs to be said because he's leaving. And then me as a pastor, I get to say, well, let's look at what this brother said and let's see if it resonates. The great thing is we get to be 
God's revivalists. Since this ain't our home, and we don't have to have fear about people who, who really, I mean, you know, they need to hear what they need to hear, and they need to see what they need to see, irregardless of the repercussions that will happen to us. So if we look at ourselves as God's revival, that's going on, that should make a difference in our life. We're starting to read stories and, and, and things of, uh, of people uh, basically losing their jobs because they're Christians. Because they decided to be a revivalist. Because I'm not ashamed of my Jesus. People are losing jobs because of it. It's crazy. We're in the midst of those kind of things. But yet God says, those are the kind of things that bring me glory. Because they understand that they're just passing through. They're just pilgrims. He says, I want you to abstain from fleshly lusts which battle against the life, the life that is in you now. And there's not a day that some of us really don't go through that intense battle of the things of this world. And how the things of this world would try to entice us and, and distract us. And how the things of this world would try to keep us blinded by the very fact of what, is, what God is doing in us and what is going on around us. He says, I want you to have your behavior among the Gentiles good so that when they speak against you as evil doers, doers let them. Because the only reason they're going to come at you is by observing your good works because you glorify God. In the day of wisdom. In other words, if, if people are going to throw sticks and stones and try to break your bones and call you bad names, at least let us do it because we're lovers and followers of Jesus. Let that be the reason. Let Jesus be the reason. Let Christ be the reason. Let God's glory be the reason because look, life ain't perfect. Is it? Some of you today, right now, dread going to work tomorrow. <laughs> the only thing I can say to you is, it ain't always going to be this way. But the other thing is this. Don't give in. To the world's ways. Because God will give us wisdom on how to bring Him glory even in the midst of the worst circumstances. Because since I'm a, a journeyman and a pilgrim, the job that I have, the job that you have, is only going to last as long as this place lasts. That's all it is. And if God says, everything you do, the way you eat and drink, everything you do, do it all to the glory of God, God will give you everything you need to face what you need to face. He did it for Stephen. He did it for Stephen. And I think He gives it to us no matter what kind of situation we may find ourselves in. God changes us for His glory. The third thing is that God sustains us for His glory. God sustains us for His glory. Verse 13 says that we need to look for the blessed expectation and esteemed appearance of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Messiah. God sustains us because He understands how tough this world is. And, and that's the reason, one of the reasons why He sent Jesus in the flesh. It tells us in Hebrews that Jesus went through every temptation like we did. And yet he did not what? Sin. That makes him our perfect high priest. It makes him perfect so that when you and I go to him with any kind of temptation or any kind of problem that you and I are facing, Jesus can look at you, man, I'm with you. I know exactly what you're going through. He can say that. Because how many times have you went to people in your life seeking great counsel and they've never walked in your shoes? They don't know what you went through, right? They got no clue. However, Jesus does. Scripture says it. He has gone through. He has faced every temptation, every 
thing that you and I can possibly ever deal with, He went through it. And He can look at us dead in the eyes and say, I know exactly how you feel. I know exactly what you're going through. I know exactly what you'd like to do. I've been there. However, however, he says, you don't have to sin in this situation. You can honor the Father by doing it His way. And that's the moment we get clarity. That's the moment retribution begins to be set aside. Because see, here's the deal. No matter how someone has hurt you and you go back and hurt them, we still got two hurt people. And we got people, since they're hurt, will grow in bitterness and will never let it go. And yet Jesus says, I know what you're going through. I have been there. Jesus, I've been betrayed. I know what it is to be betrayed. Jesus, I know what it is to be lonely. Jesus, I know what it is to, to stand when everybody else wants to sit down. Jesus, I know what it's like when and everybody else wants to run to the, the greatest fad and stay true to the Father. And I know what it's like not to have friends. I know what it's like to be have names called. He says, I know all about that. And many other things. But you don't have to sin. I don't know about you, but that gives me a, that is an amazing thing for me. With all of this stuff, have I do not have to sin to get back to it. That's why God sustains us for His glory. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes it like this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 and 9, and then verses 15 and 17. Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. In other words, I have Christ in me, so that the excellence of the power might be of God and not of us. In other words, when people see me, it ain't about me, they're going to understand it's all about Him. We are being hard-pressed on every side. And let me tell you something, as we get closer to the end of this age, we're going to need all the sustaining power that God can give us. Because when you begin to look at what Paul is saying here, he says we're going to be hard-pressed on every side. Absolutely. For us as believers, it ain't going to be easy. We're going to be hard-pressed on every side. In fact, we're already being hard-pressed on every side. We're being hard-pressed on every, every aspect of anything that ever used to mean something to God and used to mean something to us. So we're already being hard-pressed, which tells us something about where we are in this present age. He goes on and says, we will be perplexed sometimes, but we will not be in despair. There are sometimes we will still scratch our heads. There will be sometimes that seriously, really, but we will not be in despair. We will be persecuted, but we will not be forsaken. We might be thrown down, but we will not be destroyed. Therefore, listen to what Paul says, therefore we do not lose heart. But even if our outward man is perishing, this past week I was served my first senior coffee. I think Ed set me up. He said, Tim, let's go to McDonald's because Ed has a latte addiction. I try to work with him all the time. Went to McDonald's and I, he said, I'm going to get a latte. I said, I'll just get a coffee, Ed, because I can quit coffee anytime. I just want to show you. I'm going to drink with you. No one should drink alone. But we went up to the counter. <laughs> Went up there, and I said, Ed, Ed I'll, I'll pay for our latte. He said, well, yeah, thank you. And so the, the little girl behind the counter reached, look, I gave you the senior coffee. She said, you just paying for it. And I said, do I look senior? No, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to do that. I said, no, you're saying I look old. And Ed was really loving it. That's why you saw the picture. 
And then the girl behind the counter made it even work. When my, when my dad's 55, ah, 55, there you go. There's that magic number. I was perplexed, but I was not in despair. I felt like I was forsaken, but I was not thrown down. Therefore, we do not lose heart. But even if our outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day to day. I like the, 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 the beautiful part about growing old as a believer. You know, when you will say that you're only as old as you feel. I think we, for us as gray hair folks who love Jesus, we're, we are only as old as our heart has grown cold to the fact that God is still showing His glory through us. For this slight momentary pressure, listen to that. I love, even, God, you would almost think that, Paul, are you in denial about what's going on? Because Paul, when he wrote this, was in prison. Come on, Paul, are you in denial? Look around you, man. It's not great. And Paul could have said, yeah, I see what you're talking about, but since I'm a pilgrim and a sojourner, these bars in this cell is not really my home. And so he says, for this slight momentary pressure is working for us a far more exceedingly and everlasting weight of glory. Don't get caught up in your surroundings and circumstances. For these are nothing compared to the exceeding great glories that you and I will get to see and have and already really are in possession of when this present age comes to end. Number four, God cleanses us for His glory. He says, He gave Himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for Himself a people, His own possession, ardent for good works. Paul writes in Hebrews, How much more shall the blood of Messiah, who through the everlasting Spirit offered Himself unblemished to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? It's awesome to think that no longer I have to work for my salvation. Jesus has already done the work for me. He's already done the work for me. Again, it's not Jesus plus something that gets us there. It's Jesus and Him alone. He's already done the work. His is the only blood that had to be spilled. He gave Himself for us. I love what Revelation tells us. That we are overcomers through the what? The blood of the... Lamb, which leads to the word of our testimony. I got a feeling in these last days we won't get to really use that. Hebrews chapter 10. Paul again reminds us, let us draw near with a true heart. In completeness of belief. The beautiful thing about us being saved by grace through and by the glory of God through His Son, Jesus, is that at some point in our life, we will have that completeness of belief. In other words, no more wavering, no more teetering, no more tottering on certain things. And is God really going to deliver what God says He would deliver? Look, I can tell you, because not because I know, because God's Word tells me that whatever God says, He will deliver. Whatever He says is going to take place. Whatever He has promised, He will give. Whatever covenant He has made, He will keep it. Whatever He has said about your situation, my situation, whatever it is, everything that God has ever said that has been revealed to us through His Word is going to be done. It's going to be done. Do you realize that of all, and there's a tons of prophecies in, in, in the Scripture, do you realize there's just, just a few left? In fact, what that means is that God has already fulfilled every one of them. We don't think in those terms, do we, a lot of times? But He sure has. He sure has. His word is sure, and what He says will take place. So he says, let us draw near with a true heart and completeness of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from a wicked conscience and our bodies 
washed with clean water. And let us hold fast the confession of our expectation. In other words, let me tell you, you can bring glory to Him when, when people say, are you all that? Man, I am not all this. I'm not, not even a bag of chips. But what you do see is this. Listen to this. Can you imagine us using this verse when someone asks us, what you see is this. That if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It really doesn't matter if they don't understand it. What really matters is, do you? Do you? Do you understand that? Do you understand? Do we really understand when we look in that mirror every morning and the evening and whenever we do, that's a new creation. It's a new creation. And lastly, God restores us for His glory. God restores us for His glory. In verse 15, God reminds us that you need to speak about these matters. Urge and reprove people. You know, reprove yourself with all authority. Let people know that they are saved for the glory of God. Let people know that God changes them for His glory. Let them know that God sustains us for His glory. And let, let them know that God cleanses us for His glory. Let no one despise you. Proverbs 24, 16 says, For seven times a righteous man falls and he rises. Man, I'm telling you, you may think, seriously, I have fallen a lot more than seven times. That's one of those numbers that God throws out there. Say, so you can fall on your... But see, here's the thing about a righteous man. Here's the thing about a righteous person. When they fall, they know it. It may take a while. The prodigal knew what he was doing was wrong when he left the father's house. He had to because he was a Jewish young man. And when, when Jewish kids left home, he was as say, hey, dad, you're dead to me. I'm gone. Sometimes we may look at God, I'm dead to you, man. It just ain't working. And we do our walking. And at some point, He woos us back. I don't know many dads who would hear a kid say, Hey, Dad, you're dead to me. They could love a kid so ferociously and fiercely as the father did when his son came back. I mean, when he came back, basically, the father threw him the farm, put my robe on him, put my ring on him, killed the best calf we got. We're having steaks tonight. For the one who was lost is now what? Four. And you know, the father did it all for his glory. For he is going. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he will get up. We close with this verse, 1 Peter chapter 5. It says, And the God of all grace, who what? Called you. The only reason you're in the faith is because God has called you into the faith. And the God of all grace, who called you to his everlasting glory by Messiah Jesus. After you have suffered a while, listen to what he says, himself will perfect. God's perfecting you. You can't perfect yourself. He says, I will establish you. You can't. We can't decide this. God is the one that establishes us. God says, I'll strengthen you. Even when you are, feel like you're on your last leg, he said, seriously, you're not on your last leg? He says, I've Gave people legs. That I will strengthen you. And I love this last word. He says, I'm going to settle you. In other words, he says, in a world that thinks they know peace, which is a false peace, he says, I'll bring you real peace. I will bring you what real peace is all about. You will have a calmness in your heart that even when everything around you seems to be falling apart, He says, I'm going to give you a peace 
that will pass all your understanding. He says, I'm going to give you a peace that is going to be a wow factor in your life because you'll try to figure out why you feel the way you feel and there's no other way to say how you feel except it's Christ in you. Because everything else in your life would tell you to cash it in and give up. But yet there's a peace that only Jesus gives to His own. That's the power of the grace of God. God's grace is for His glory and His glory alone. I want you to stand with me as we close. We have a couple of songs that the praise team is going to sing, but we also have a couple of challenges that we'll throw out there for all of us who are God's people here. The song they're going to be singing is this first one is from the inside out. From the inside out. That's how God's grace works from the inside out. <laughs> this morning, this morning, if you are a believer and you're looking at these things that, you know, God, I'm, I'm glad you saved me and, and, and God, I, I, I realize that you're, you're changing some things in my life, but yet, God, there seems to be the, the things that I'm struggling with, listen to me, because I've been there. Isn't it amazing that the things that we struggle with are the things that we're trying to hang on to? Think about that for a moment. The reason I'm, I'm struggling with areas in my life is because I'm trying to hang on to those areas. And I'm not, I'm not letting God's grace change me. And I'm not letting God's grace really restore me. I'm not letting His grace cleanse me. I mean, I'm saved and, and I understand that and, and I know you're changing me, but so you're still holding on. One of the greatest things about our Father is this. Bring your, and let's call it what it is, let's bring our sin. Let's bring our sin and let's bring it to Him for the glory of who He is. Because can I tell you something? For His name's sake, He will not let you be mastered by that which He has defeated in your life, which is sin through His Son. So, Barn, I'm going to ask if you would hit the lights. As they are singing, if you want to pray and do business right there with God, say, God, I'm saved, but you know I'm struggling with things I'm hanging on. Help me to let it go. And the only way I can let it go is for you to do your work from the inside out. So as we sing this song, if you want to come here and pray, that's fine. If you want to do God's work right there where you're at, God can work anywhere. It's not about a place. It's about a person. Go ahead, Leah.